Now that, my friends, is what we call an address. Look at that big, bold lettering. Black ink on white plastic. A little bit wrinkled, a little bit bloodied, but not unbowed. It is indeed what we think it is. It is my address. Me, Malcolm Tent. Look at that. P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut. 06470. Memorize it, but don't memorize it too heavily. And I'll tell you why here as we do. Tent Talks Tunes. Uh, yes. It is happening. It is live. It is the real deal. I'm back from the tour. I'm back from the road. And I am here comfortably ensconced at uh, my cabin in the woods here in the greater Danbury area with a trusty jug of Danbury tap, as is my habit. And it looks like my angle's a little bit off, so let's adjust the angle ever so slightly so I'm not as crooked. I try to walk a straight line and play a straight game, but that's only if the camera cooperates. James Pogo wants to know when the tent yard sale is. Well, James Pogo, I'll tell you what, let me finish adjusting this camera here. Because, you know, it's live. We are 100% actually, to heck with that. I think that, I think that angle is just fine. There we go. Alan Versapellis. Hey, how do you like my shirt? How do you like my Jello Swayze shirt, Alan Versapellis? Harry the Cat seems to like it. He's right on board for it. And I put that shirt on and start talking to you, and here comes Harry the Cat. Look at this guy. The camera hog of this decade and many other decades. I'm sure if he keeps at it like this and he stays alive and lives to a ripe old cat age, he's going to be hogging this camera for a good long time. Is anybody good at getting screenshots? Anybody want to get a screenshot of this guy? How about it? There's, there's a close-up. Who wants to get a screenshot of this guy and send it to me? And I ask you because I'm working on the Harry the Cat cassette and CD even as we speak. I'm editing the sounds of his purring most diligently. And it's very funny because I was editing the sounds of Harry the Cat purring at, um, I'm not going to say ear splitting volume, but kind of a loud volume last night. And after about a half hour of it, I had this mad need to take a nap. And uh, that normally doesn't happen, but I think that the sounds of old Harry at about 40 or 50 decibels or whatever it was, lulled me right into a very restful state. And I went down and I was deeply asleep. I mean, deeply asleep for about an hour and a half after editing the sounds of Harry the Cat purring. So the release of Harry the Cat is uh, drawing nigh, but I need good images for the packaging. And so if anybody was kind enough to um, take a screenshot of that and send it over to me, I will not only use it, on the Harry the Cat cassette and CD, but I will also save a spot for you in heaven, should I get there before I do. And I see somebody is calling me on the phone. I'm going to have to hang up on them because I'm live. I love you guys, but I can only multitask so much. Uh, Mike Lesser from Vancouver, BC says, Howdy. Alan Versapellis, you want to post a link in the comments sections to some Jello Swayze stuff. I think the people need to hear it. Alan Versapellis is not only a fan, he is an artist himself and a musician and a noisemaker. And I've checked out the Jello Swayze stuff and gotten enjoyment from it. So maybe you people will too. Alan, let's see a link while I wet my whistle. You can post that there link. Anyway, circling right back to my original line of commentary, James Pogo says he wants to know when is the tent yard sale because he might be interested in those maximum rock and roll radio show cassettes, which I spoke of a while ago. And some of you people out there might say, well, gee whiz, yard sale, what's he talking about? Why would Malcolm Tent be having a yard sale? Well, if you saw the teaser 
earlier today on the Facebook, which I'm going to assume you did, otherwise you wouldn't be here, or if you saw my post yesterday on the various social medias, I let the proverbial, not the literal, the proverbial cat out of the bag and broke the news to the world that I, Malcolm Tent from Danbury, Connecticut, am uh, working on being Malcolm Tent from somewhere in North Carolina. And yes, yes, indeed he do. I told many people over the years that Connecticut was the stop. And Connecticut certainly was the stop for a good long time. But circumstances have changed. Circumstances have changed. By the way, here's more screenshot material for you guys. Get a load of that. Is that a front cover for a CD and a cassette or what? Oh, boy. Yes. Almost exactly. Well, I'll preface it by saying that I've, I've said for a very long time that there are two, not one, but two very bad reasons to move. Two very bad reasons. And uh, yeah, I might be a little bit cynical. I might be a little bit jaundiced. I might be very, very skeptical. But I've always thought there were two terrible reasons to uproot your life and pack it up and move somewhere else. Number one, join a band. Very bad reason to uproot your entire life and schlep it 800 miles away to join a band. Very, very bad reason to do that. I've seen it happen. I've seen it go down in flames many times. So I'd always maintain that it's a bad policy to move a long distance to join a band unless you're going to be ready to boomerang right on back to where you came from. Reason number two. Reason number two, very bad reason to pack up your life and move. To be in a relationship. How many times have we seen it happen? How many times have we heard of it happening? How many times have we maybe experienced it ourselves? You get into a relationship. You want to be next to your loved ones. So you rip your existence out of the roots. Shake the dirt out of it. Put it in a box. Ship the box to where they are. And how often have we seen that end in disaster? Remember, I'm just taking the devil's advocate, skeptical, show-me viewpoint. So yes, two very bad reasons to uproot your life and move it elsewhere. Jenny DeSoto, you know what I'm talking about? Bruiser Braswell, you hear what I'm saying? Two bad reasons. So why is Malcolm Tent from Danbury, Connecticut soon to be known as Malcolm Tent from North Carolina. Well, to join a band and to be with a girl. Simple, right? Simple. As Klaus Nomi once said, I am a simple man. Man, I can't hit the sinus the way he did. But it's simple. I'm moving to be closer to anti-scene and to be closer to my number one main babe, Chrissy. Yes, I'm doing it. And considering, um, considering how bad a motivator I think those two reasons are, why would I be doing that? Why, 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 why? Well, first of all, I've got a, a mile-wide streak of perversity running through my personality. The personality of perversity. Oh, boy. But you look at the numbers. Let's look at the numbers, shall we? Yesterday marked the almost exact fifth anniversary of my first tour of duty with Anti-Scene. I have been in that band now for exactly five years. Five years and two weeks, if you count the beginning of the first tour I did with them. So after five years, that seems like a pretty safe bet. And considering that the band has been around for 40 plus years, that seems like a pretty safe bet. And considering that we have sat around the round table and, and mapped out strategy, the long-term goal of Anti-Scene is to make it to at least 50. We already have some plans in place for the 45th anniversary show. And after that, you know there's going to have to be something gala for the 50th. So we're already looking minimum of 10 years into the future for Anti-Scene. And I've known these guys almost since the very beginning, 
And so I know this ain't no flash in the pan. Anti-scene is the real deal, and we're in it to win it. The death train is a long-haul freight train. So, okay. Probably a pretty safe bet to move to North Carolina to be close to the number one band that I'm in. Reason number two. Um... I've been with Chrissy now for coming up on three years. It's going to be three years in August. And we have rolled up our collective sleeves and furred our collective brows and put a lot of sweat, sweat equity into making the relationship work. And so far, after almost three years of long distance, it's been working. And the very fact that this is not a snap decision, it's not a spur of the moment decision, it's a decision that's required a lot of thought and a lot of forethought and a lot of planning. And the fact that um, we are both really willing to put in the labor to make it work, I think it's a safe bet. So what could be two lousy reasons, in this case, are, I th think, two pretty good safe bets. So that's what I'm doing. I'm moving to North Carolina. I have a sort of set a target for the end of the year. I don't know how accurate or realistic that is because as Jenny DeSoto pointed out a second ago, I got a lot of records. I got a lot of records. I got a lot of stuff in general. Oh boy, have I got stuff. And I really am not in the mood to pack and ship and schlep and hump all this stuff down to North Carolina. So I have announced I'm going to have the yard sale to end all yard sales. Lord willing and the creeks don't rise sometime over the summer. Um, but to get back to the main point, I got a lot of stuff. Oh man. I spent today packing boxes of books, boxes of VHS tapes, uh, boxes of knickknacks and bric-a-brac and ephemera. I have boxes of tiki stuff. I have, um, God, black velvet paintings, stacks of black velvet paintings. This is all left over from the glory days of the brick-and-mortar trash American style. You know, anybody who was there, like Jenny DeSoto and some of you people watching, know that it was a record store, clothing store. We called it a uh, psycho thrift shop. And so I never lost my love for cultural detritus. And it's impossible for me to walk away from something like that. I was uh, just at the thrift shop the other day and I found this really amazing old um, Ziggy framed piece of what they call fair glass. You would get it at the county fair if you could like throw the ball and knock over some bottles, you would get a prize. And the prize is usually a really cheap, framed, gaudy-looking picture of whatever was popular at the time. And so there was a Ziggy, one of these things at the thrift shop. How, how can you walk away from that? It's not possible to walk away from something like that. So of course I got it. And that's going to be in the yard sale. Jenny DeSoto says, if I am downsizing... Tiki, keep you posted. Yes, I'm going to, Jenny. It's it's happening. It's totally happening. Fair warning, not a lot of it is vintage, but uh, it's cool. It's cool. I got a couple tubs of that, and I, I got some stuff that is vintage. Most of it's not vintage, but it's pretty neat. I got it from a friend of mine who had a tiki bar in the Poconos, and she loved her tiki. So that's all going to be going out. Uh, let's take a look at some other comments here. Robbie Rob wants to know what part of North Carolina. Not 100% sure yet. Um, the band is in Charlotte. My girl is in Hickory. So I want to be accessible to both, but I want to be away from Charlotte. I don't want to be part of the explosive urban expansion, excuse me, that Hickory is um, well known for these days. Uh, I don't want to be near that. I also, these days, probably could not afford to live in Charlotte. Uh, but there's plenty of outlying areas, like 
north, west, east, maybe even south. Plenty of little towns sort of around Hickory that are affordable and are still, you know, within an hour or so of Charlotte and like a half hour or so of Hickory. You know, that's just kind of what I'm aiming at. Uh, real middle of the nowhere, North Carolina. Um, as long as I can get to a bank and a post office within, you know, driving distance, I'm, I'm pretty good. You know, I can run my I can run my mail order from just about anywhere. All I, all I need to do is be able to get to the post office once a week. You know, with a big old load of stuff, a lot of boxes to ship out to my customers. That's really about it, you know. And um, from North Carolina, it's good because I can hub out to towns like Atlanta, D.C., Richmond, uh, Ohio is about the same distance from there as it is here. So it's pretty central to a lot of my needs for doing record shows and live selling events. So I'm pretty excited about it. I think it's going to be a really good thing. And as someone pointed out, uh, definitely more affordable. It is more affordable. Um, so if all goes well, I'll be able to sell a bunch of stuff, have a lighter load to carry around and have maybe a little more room to set up my business and uh, carry on with TPOS and Trash American style and be closer to my band and closer to my chick. What's not to love? What's not to love? Let's drink a toast of Danbury Tap or whatever it is you drink to positive change, forward movement, and going onward and upward. Those are just a few of my specialties. Robbie Rob says North Carolina is a great place. I agree. I like North Carolina quite a bit. Um, Robbie Rob says legendary wrestling went down in Greensboro. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed he do. The Mid-South Territory. Uh, Mid-Atlantic Territory, I should say. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, good cultural roots in the Carolinas. Um, the first out-of-town show I ever played with Broken Talent back in 1984 was in North Carolina. Uh, my first proper road gig as a solo in 2011 was in North Carolina. Definitely have a deep affinity for North Carolina. So, And the little factoid is I was born in South Carolina and raised in Florida. So, you know, I'm, I'm a transplanted Southerner who's lived in Connecticut for the last 38 years almost, and I've loved every minute of it. But, uh, yeah, my homeland is beckoning, so I'm going to heed the call. Walt Wheat, my compatriot in the almighty anti-scene, the guy who clad the Thunder Lumba in leather, the man himself who did that. Oh, what did he say? Something about Harry. The warmer climate means less dander for Harry as well. That is true. We'll probably be doing a lot less of this when we get Harry into a warmer climate. Can you guys see that? It's like a veritable snowstorm around here because it's getting warmer here and boy is he shedding. I brush this little guy once or twice a day, but it doesn't matter. You can stuff a pillow with this. So yes, maybe a little bit less of that once we're settled into a, a warmer climb. So uh, that's the basic deal, guys. Malcolm Tent is moving to North Carolina and is very happy about it and uh, looking forward to some good change. And I will keep everybody posted about the timetable on that and the big old yard sale and um, other things of that nature. What a great cue to take a look at the bulletin board. Yes, we've got events coming up hither and yon, near and far, soon and not so soon. I guess the most immediate one that's got me excited kind of relates to all this, the Danbury Record and CD Expo, May 4th in Danbury at VFW Hall number 149. It's going to be a room full of people selling records, tapes, CDs, memorabilia, whatever. And yes, I will be there because I co-promote the event. I will have not one, not two, but three tables full of stuff, records, tapes, TPOS product, so y'all might want to go down and check that out May 4th, Saturday at VFW Hall number 149 in Danbury, the Danbury Record and CD Expo. Let's see, what else is happening? Oh, look at that. Very soon after that, May 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th, 
the band that I am moving to North Carolina to be closer to the almighty anti-scene. We are playing in Atlanta, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Wilmington, North Carolina, and Raleigh, North Carolina, May 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th. That's four nights in a row of premier destructo rock played by the Ultra lineup. The last little run of shows we did was awesome. It was fun and a half. I'll be talking about that more in a minute or two. Totally got my appetite whetted for more. And check this out. Here's a rare sighting of Ultra Bunny. Look at that. Ultra Bunny is playing June 14th in Brooklyn. And I'm pretty stoked about that, man. I have not played a gig with those guys in several years at this point. I mean, it's an all improv noise rock band. We rock. Ultra Bunny is rock, but we make it up on the spot. So just imagine, if you will, Flipper crossed with Hawkwind, crossed with maybe Joy Division or The Fall. It's about the repetitive driving bass lines and lots of noise layered on top of it. So if you think that might float your boat, June 14th in Brooklyn, and look who we're playing with, the great Martin Bisi, Mustafina, and a band who I don't know about, but they're called No Love Songs, and that right off the bat makes me want to like them. So yes, June 14th at Young Ethel's in Brooklyn. Ultra Bunny. And uh, Chrissy, a.k.a. Pissy Chrissy, TPOS re recording artist Chrissy Pissy, Pissy Chrissy, uh, wants to know what drummer is Ultra Bunny going to sport that night? A valid question, Ms. Pissy Chrissy, because Ultra Bunny consists of myself and Bobby Bunny and a rotating cast of drummers. Uh, for the gig at Young Ethel, we're going to have Young Evan as our drummer. Evan is a Connecticut expatriate. He is young. He is the master of many instruments and a heck of a songwriter in his own right. And he is going to be beating the tubs for us at Young Ethel on June 14th. And we did a couple of tours with him, and basically every show we played with him was good. So, very excited about that. That's upcoming events. The Danbury Record and CD Expo, Anti-Scene Mini Tour, Ultra Bunny. Let's check the mail, shall we? Oh boy, I love checking the mail. Well, we already saw one thing that came, a very classy Jello Swayze t-shirt from my pal Alan. I don't know if Alan posted any links to his stuff, but uh, hopefully he did. And y'all can scroll back and see exactly what this Jello Swayze stuff is all about. It's hard to describe, but it's indescribably delicious. What else did we get in the mail? Oh, here's a package. And this, I think I, I know what's in this already. This is from my pal Beer. Mr. Beer in San Antonio, Texas. Oh, yeah. Jenny DeSoto says, Eek! You have some energy to do four shows in a row at your age. Well, Jenny, let me tell you. I'm 59 going on 19, baby. The rock and roll is what keeps me young. The rock and roll is what keeps me spry. If I had my druthers, we'd be playing eight shows in two days. I'm not joking either. That's the way I like to do it. When I go on my solo acoustic tours, I make a point of playing a minimum of one show a day. If I can squeeze in two, I'll do it. My good pal Shannon Naff booked me to four shows in one day in Roanoke, Virginia, a few years back. That's a career highlight. I played four shows in one day in Roanoke, and I loved it. Loved every second of it. So what did beer send me from San Antonio? Well, as predicted, as guessed, it must be the brand new, and I've been waiting for this for a while, very exciting, the brand new Rancid Vat. Full-length, compact disc. There it is, kids. You're seeing it right now. 
Front cover art by Mr. Jeff Clayton himself. Already, it's worth having. Let's look at some of the song titles on this. Oh, man. Track one, The Ugandan Giant. You know, you know we're on the right path now. It Ain't Me, Too Stupid to Live, You Don't Measure Up, Lonely at the Bottom, Run You Down, Mad Gasser, Fun Hate. Yep, sure sounds like Rancid Bat to me. There's the front. There's the back. And, ah, as threatened and promised, fully autographed. Beer knows how to float my boat. <laughs> Thank you, Beer. This is going to be played on the next road trip to North Carolina. Painfully loud, most likely, just like it is when Rancid Bat plays live. Those guys are obnoxious. That's why we love them. And also a mystery disc. What is this that Beer sent me? I don't know what this is. There are no identifying marks on it. It's very artistic. What is it? Let's find out. Amy, how did you miss the new Rancid Vat? Well, now you know about it. Now you know. You better get you some. And what is this mysterious and enigmatic CD? Hmm. I have no idea. But I see plenty of uh, Rancid Vat alum on this. I'm intrigued. It's a mystery. And the only way to solve the mystery is to listen to it, which is what I'm going to do. So thank you, Beer. Thank you for helping to clog my ears with desirable noise. I look forward to it. It's going to be good. All right, what else do we got here? Well, we got a box. And this is one of those things rattles a little bit. I was not expecting this. This is a box that I was not expecting. Ah. Except in a generalized sense, because the return address is from Mobile, Alabama, and the sender is Mr. Dennis Highland. Dennis Highland, the CEO of Jackhammer Music, that is the Japanese record label that has released some anti-scene stuff. They released the compact disc version of our latest album, Great Disasters. They released the split 10 inch with Before I Hang. And Dennis has been known to send me, completely at random, out of nowhere, boxes of things. He sent me a couple of thrift shops in a box, and I did, un I did unveilings of those on Tent Talks Tunes in the past. And if you want to see what that means, dude, Go to my YouTube channel and look it up. Fun galore. Cold unboxings of mysterious contents. And that's what we got right here. This is a box. I don't know what's in it. It's kind of light. There's some rattling. I was not expecting it. Let's get the brand new One Mile Scissors and very carefully open the box and see what's in it. You guys are discovering this along with me. This is live unboxing. In the true spirit of classic cable TV. I don't know what's going to happen. Hopefully it's not a big spring that's going to jump out and startle me. Mm, 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 mm. Alright, here we go. Oh, Got to open up some more here. I would grab the box cutter, but I'm lazy. Watch me gouge myself in the ribs live on Facebook. Maybe not. The box is opened. We see packing material. We see more packing material. We see more packing material. We see more packing material. We see a lot of packing material. And one item. Okay. This is one item. Now it looks extremely promising because you people know. Yes, Amy. New scissors. The million mile scissors finally died. I killed them. The handles broke, and then the whole thing fell apart. So the Million Mile Scissors, rest in peace. So I'm working on a brand new pair, and we're up to uh, less than one mile. <laughs> but 
but I got plenty of time to put some miles on them scissors. So it's an eight track. You people know me, you know I love eight tracks, but I can't see what it is because of the bubble wrap. Let's find out. This is exciting. Anytime I get a new eight track in the mail, it's very exciting. Oh my God. <laughs> oh man. Dennis Highland, you have just legit freaked me out. Live on Facebook and archived forever on my permanent record on YouTube and on Facebook. Oh man, this is something. Dennis Highland definitely has paid attention to what I've said on Tent Talks Tunes. And I am going to <laughs> I am going to ask you people right now. If you people have been uh, taking notes to some things I've said in the past here on Tent Talks Tunes. Here's a pop quiz for you. Pop quiz, all you Tent Talks tuners out there. What is my favorite Lou Reed solo album? And I don't mean Velvet Underground. I mean Lou Reed is a solo artist. What is my favorite Lou Reed solo album? Let's see. Grant Den said Grand Funk. Close, but not quite. Excuse me. James Pogo wants to know if it's a metal machine. Mmm, James Pogo. Smart man. Very attentive. Yes. James Pogo got the right answer in Johnny on the Spot Lickety Split, my favorite Lou Reed album of all time. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Is metal machine music. And we know I love 8-tracks. Dennis Highland knows that my want list for many, many years has had this particular item. Look at that, kids. Metal Machine Music on 8-track. O-M-G. It doesn't take much to make Malcolm Tent happy. But it does take a little bit of extra effort to make him ecstatic. I'm a guy in ecstasy right now. It's beautiful condition, too. Oh, fantastic. Metal Machine, Metal Machine Music on 8-track. That is legit a want list item that I can finally cross off after many years. Dennis, you are a gentleman. Thank you for that. I wish... I wish... Well, I'm, I'm just going to think about it real hard because I love to reciprocate. But Dennis is kind of the man who has everything. So I'm going to think real hard about something to exchange for this. Just because I want to. Because I like doing that. Because I like to reciprocate. So the wheels are turning. And with the aid of Metal Machine Music playing on my 8-track player, I just might come up with something. Dennis... Thank you. James Pogo says, of course, in beautiful condition. What do you think the odds are of finding one of these things beat up? You know, Did anybody ever play it more than 30 seconds? I doubt it. Fantastic. That's going to be a great mantelpiece item in my new home in North Carolina. Love it. Love it. Mr. Alan Versapellis also sent something in the mail along with this classy Jello Swayze shirt. And this is very ironic, very ironic indeed. Because last night, my boss in anti scene, Mr. Jeff Clayton, did his web stream called Break On Through. And he was being interviewed by Mr. Mondo Braswell himself. And somewhere in the course of the conversation, the origin of the anti-scene gun logo came up. And there's some very interesting roots to that logo. Um, I'm not going to be the spoiler. If you want to find out, check out Break On Through. It's archived on the anti-scene official Facebook page and on the anti-scene official YouTube channel. And it's just really ironic because one thing Jeff Clayton did say was that the image of the gun was taken from a piece of clip art. And, you know, you folks of a certain generation 
or maybe even nowadays know what clip art is. Clip art is just generic images that you are, they're royalty free, they're copyright free. You would buy this big old book with all of these totally generic, stark black and white images, excuse me, that you would literally clip out of the book and paste onto your art project, whether it was a, a flyer or, I mean, I, I used them for flyers. So you would clip out the art and use it. And he said that the gun logo was from a piece of clip art. And wouldn't you know, the very next day I opened this package from Alan Versapellis to find a really cool issue of Fact Sheet 5, which was a great zine back in its day. Guess what's on the back cover? As he pointed out, Alan pointed out the back cover. The very clip art that Jeff used to make the anti-scene logo. There it is. The one and only, taken completely in a different context on an issue of Fact Sheet 5. That's frameable art, kids. Frameable. So thank you, Alan. That's that's definitely a piece of uh, arcana for the anti-scene archives. And this was actually an ad for Exit Magazine back in 1989. Wowzers. Ah, Dennis Highland is tuned in even as we speak. He says, you are now the proud owner. We can only hope it came from a Woolworths, like the one that Thurston Moore had. Can you imagine it, it, how many of those were offered for sale at Woolworths or JCPenney or Woolco? And just imagine some poor schlep like myself walking into Sears and seeing the display of eight tracks and saying, oh boy, a new Lou Reed record. This is great. And buying metal machine music. I mean, I would have loved it, I think. But most people did not. Hence its desirability on any format. But on eight track, hey, that's a thing. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. I drink to you and your health. And your continued excellent taste. Yes, sir. Let's see. Walt Wheat says that you could not run through 10 pages of shotgun news in its heyday without seeing that revolver clip art five or six times. Interesting. Interesting. See, I never saw it until I saw it used in the anti-scene logo. So I guess it was a, a rather popular piece of clip art. Go figure. So Walt, my compadre in anti-scene, he was with me for some of these acquisitions. Um, we just did a run of shows together. Anti-Scene played the, <laughs> excuse me, Eat the Turnbuckle Final Bloodbath Battle Royal in Philadelphia. And I got to tell you guys, it was an event that lived up to its name. You had not only Anti-Scene, but of course, Eat the Turnbuckle. You had Fang. You had Ringworm. There was one other band who played. I did not catch their name and I did not catch their set. I'm sorry about that, but I was just running around like a nut. But um, those fine bands and, I don't know, 12, 13, 14, 15 deathmatch professional wrestlers. And um, it was quite an event. It was quite an event. Bruiser Braswell, you're tuned in now. How would you describe the Eat the Turnbuckle final bloodbath battle royal in one or two sentences. What would you, how would you describe it? The people want to know. I want to know. Ah, Walt Wheat says that the other band was called Ground. Thank you, Walt. I'm assuming they were from Philly. Uh, sorry I missed them. One, one of the great joys of touring is seeing all the bands. You know, I love seeing all the bands, the local bands, the touring bands. And it really grieves me when I miss any of them. But I remember I was starving. And um, a super fan was making food for us, but he got caught in traffic because all of the bridges to Philly were closed. One of them had a jumper. One of them had been rammed by a truck. And the other one was the scene of a giant drug bust. So no one was getting into Philly by any of the easy routes. So I was starving and I was off in pursuit of food. That's why I missed ground. Anyway, 
We played shows. We played Philly. We played York, Pennsylvania. We played Youngstown, Ohio. And of course, when I was on my way up and down to meet Anti-Scene, I hit all the record stores in my path and did some trading and some swapping and some horse dealing because my label, TPOS, I love to hit the record stores and trade my stuff for theirs. And I found a few things. I'm, I'm going to start right off the bat with, I mean, we, we've just, we've already had one super duper heavy hitter unveiled today on Tent Talks Tunes. And um, we might as well go for another heavy hitter right now. Another item that's been on my want list for quite a while. Well, maybe not a while. I only knew about this for probably less than a year. But once I, once I learned that this thing existed, I had to have it. I needed it. I had to have it. I wanted it. I needed it. I could not live without it. So it's a good thing it took me less than a year to find one. And I found it in Youngstown, Ohio. We played at a really cool venue called the West Side Bowl. And I had always heard that the West Side Bowl was indeed a cool venue. Um, I had no idea how cool it was. It's a fully functioning, working bowling alley with some of the lanes over on one side of the room converted into a stage where bands play. And uh, so we played on this in this converted bowling alley while people were bowling over to the right of us. And you know, they've got the restaurant and the snack bar and the bar bar and all, all the great things that a bowling alley has, including, I guess what is the new thing now, a very small little record store. Yes, a small little record store. And um, obviously, I zoomed right in on that, you know, <laughs> you put me within, oh, I don't know, three or four miles of a record store, I'm going to pick up the scent and I'm going to go there. So I will reiterate, it's a very small record store, probably no bigger than, um, oh gosh, I don't know what to, to compare it to, like your, like your average size bedroom, let's say, it was about that big. And so I'm browsing, 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 and bleh, my eye was caught by this record that I did not know existed. But now all of a sudden I'm handing it, I'm holding it in my hands, and it's right here. And it's the album by Pigeon. Pigeon! Now once again, I'm going to put you guys to the test. You've heard me talk about the artist responsible for this album here on Tent Talks Tunes. This is before he became, and I kind of hate to say this, but it's true, became a complete laughingstock in the music biz. This guy started out as a hippie, like a real hippie. He was in the cast of Hair. And he had this band called Pigeon. And a couple years after that, took on a whole new persona. Excuse me. And was quite enshrouded in hype that really he could never live up to. And put out a couple of albums and was basically just shunned, drummed out of the music business and died in obscurity. But this was his very first album with a band called Pigeon. I've talked about this guy because I love this kind of stuff. See if anybody wants to guess. Who was the man behind Pigeon? Hmm? Clinton Zilla was there, actually. Yes. He said the record store was killer, and I found I found a couple of couple of uh, records for people. I found Clinton Zilla a nice score. <coughs> so Clinton Zilla, our official videographer for anti-scene, scored as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, first of all, I got to point out, this is probably the single worst album cover in the history of mankind. Mankind, A dead pigeon on a sandwich. Well, that sucks. That's a terrible, stupid album cover. And I'm sure it did not help the chances for success of this record. But uh, no one's willing to take a guess, so I'm going to tell y'all right now, the leader 
principal songwriter and keyboardist of this band, and you can't really see him because it's small and it's out of focus. But that guy, make sure I've got the right guy I'm looking at here. Yes, the one standing there in the brown jacket with his arms crossed and the long hippie hair is the keyboardist and harpsichordist who later became the man who tried to out Bowie Bowie. But you know, you can't really out anybody, anybody if they did it first. Joe Bryath. Yes, Joe Bryath. This is Joe Bryath's first band and their one and only album on the extremely second-rate and no-class DECA label. I mean, being on DECA right off the bat was pretty much the kiss of death if you were trying to be a rock and roll band. Yeah, they had hits with The Who and... Um, I guess The Who, really. That was just kind of in spite of how lame Decca was. So yeah, Joe Bryath. Joe Bryath before he was Joe Bryath. And if you guys want a real visual treat, go on the internets and look up Joe Bryath on the Midnight Special. I guarantee you've never seen anything like it. So Joe Bryath. Oh man, oh man. Here's something else. I actually got du uh, I got a duplicate of this one. I've talked about this guy a lot on 10 Talks Tunes. Check it out. Original monophonic copy of Napoleon the 14th. They're coming to take me away. Haha. -ha, the full length album. A beautiful copy. Really fresh, clean copy on the classic gold Warner Brothers label. That is old. They sold millions and millions and millions of the single of They're Coming to Take Me Away, haha, -ha, but not many of the album. This album's pretty rare. And I got this from my pal Stacy Peak at Green Eggs and Jam Records in Morganton, North Carolina. He now has a whole bunch of TPOS product in his store. And I got me a copy of They're Coming to Take Me Away, haha, -ha, on full length LP. I actually have two of them. Wouldn't you know it, I already had one. Didn't know I already had one. So now I have a spare, and I am willing to sell this one. I am willing to sell my spare copy of Napoleon the 14th. If you guys want it, hit me up. We'll talk turkey. We're talking tunes, but we will talk turkey. Where else was I? I also got at Green Eggs and Jam. You know, since I got a uh, car with a CD player in it, I've become really bullish on CDs. I've fallen in love with CDs because you can play a CD in a 2006 Subaru or a 2013 Dodge Grand Caravan. So when I see just a really good, classy title like the Best of Phil Oaks for five bucks, I got to pick it up, man. I have everything on this because I have every single album Phil Oaks ever did. But to have a best of his A&M output on one disc with photos i never seen before. Yes, I bought this at least as much for the photos. You know, it's got the, the booklet with the liner notes and all that kind of stuff. I love to geek out with liner notes and production notes and stuff like that. The classic shot of Phil Oaks in his A&M years. I love me some Phil, and I, I definitely played this one and a half times on the drive back from North Carolina. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Green Eggs and Jam. Got some other cool CDs. Our pal Travis Lee Overcash has a brand new album out, and he delivered it personally to us at Anti Scene Rehearsal Studios and signed it for me because I'm that kind of a guy. I love getting the signatures and the autographs. I am all about that. I haven't had a chance to hear it yet, but I have suspicion it's going to rock. So Travis Lee Overcash, thank you for that. I think this will be played on my next trip to North Carolina. I did also find, I mean, who doesn't love the Beatles? I love the Beatles. And I love Beatles boots. And I found a few of them in my travels. I forget where I picked these up. Four original Beatles silver discs. And unlike 
other things, I'm selling these. These are all going to be for sale. If anybody wants original Beatles 90s silvers, I got them. Listen to them. I enjoyed them. I cross-referenced them with a bunch of the other Beatles boots I have, and I'm willing to let these go. Talk to me. Also found a Dylan original 90s silver disc, primarily of some of his 1965 sessions. Very cool stuff. I'm willing to let this one go as well. So, if you want it, talk to me. If you want Beatles CDs, original 90s silvers, if you want this Dylan CD, original 90s silver disc, talk to me. I'm not keeping these. I'm also not keeping these 245s I found in at the Great Admiral Analogs Audio Assortment Record Shop in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. Man, he's got a pile of TPOS stuff in his shop now. And I walked away with a few things from his bins, one of which... I'm going to keep this one for a while, but I think I'm going to part with this one eventually. Fantastic original copy of The Sound of Wilson Pickett. This has got some real awesome up-tempo dance numbers. Soul Dance Number 3, Funky Broadway, Mojo Mama. I'm sorry about that. That one's kind of a weeper, but it's still really good. Great mix of up-tempo dance music and love songs and weepers on the drop-dead gorgeous original green and blue Atlantic label. And it's stereo. This will be a good companion piece to my exciting Wilson Pickett album, which I've talked to a lot on Tent Talks Tunes. If anybody wants to buy it, I'll sell it. But if nobody buys it, I'll keep it. Love Wilson Pickett. I love the original Atlantic sound. This is great, great stuff. 1967. Mm, 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 mm. How about this? Iggy and the Stooges. I'm sick with I'm sick of you. Backed with tight pants and scene of the crime. I couldn't pass this one up. I am selling this one. This is a vintage pressing on the Bomp label. And the history behind these tracks, in case you didn't know, was that prior to recording Raw Power, the Stooges went into the studio and recorded some demos that were rejected by probably every label that heard them. And these are three of the songs from that demo. And these songs kick ass. These songs are great. In fact, Scene of the Crime, I'm sorry, uh, Tight Pants was later reworked as Shake Appeal on the Raw Power album. But the other two songs do not appear in any way, shape, or form on any other Stooges album from that era. I got this one knowing that I already had it because I'm, I'm definitely selling this one. If anybody wants it, let me know. Great, primal, 1972 Stooges. Oh, boy. Uh, Kevin Era wants to know what year. 72. 72, maybe 73. I'm not totally sure. But it's pre-Raw Power. And it's as good as, if not better, than anything on Raw Power. In fact, I, I like this stuff better than the Raw Power tracks. No fooling. If you get that single and the I Got a Right single... You've got all five of the songs in that demo, and man, they rock. They smoke. They scorch. Dude, they kick ass. Here's one I'm also parting with. This is G.G. Allen and Jason. This is a 7-inch EP by The Disappointments from Muskegon, Michigan. I don't know how many songs are on this record, but there's a lot of songs on this record. And... They've been described as a grindcore band, but I think more accurately they would be described as Captain Beefheart and the Magic Band at about 2,000 miles an hour. This is very, very dense, complex, carefully written stuff, played with almost machine-like precision. And their claim to fame is that they later ended up backing up Gigi during his shows in 1989 and for a couple of gigs in 1991 when he got fresh out of prison. But they were a ferocious band in their own right, and this is their one and only record. It's rare as hen's teeth 
and I picked up a double for the express purpose of flogging it to you if you want it. You want it? Talk to me. It can be yours, because the price is right. Got a couple things I'm keeping for myself, though. I'm keeping a few things for myself. I love to show and tell these, because when I first learned of the existence of the Desperate Rock and Roll album series, I was hooked. This is all vintage 50s and 60s rockabilly slash rock and roll. Um, the common denominator of every single song and artist on this album is that they are fucking nuts. Every song on every one of these albums sounds like it was recorded by somebody just let loose out of the insane asylum. The stuff is over the top. All killer, no filler. Just some of the song titles alone. Um, can't Take It No More, Highway Robbery, Puppy Dogs, Playing Hide and Seek, Stop That Bop, Friendship Dan, Ain't Nothing Happening, Go Away From My Door, Bopping Martian. Look at these, the song titles, Cops Rock, Treen Solitario, This Little Old Heart. Man. Artists like Shaky Jake, Lonesome Lee, Wild Child Gibson. That's Gibson, mind you. Gene Stacks, Los Boppers. The Rackets, Bobby Fry, Teddy Reynolds. Willie Wack and the Thumpers. All original. Monroe Moe Jackson. Man, these are great. I probably have about... Easily a dozen of these volumes yet. Not a single one has ever let me down. I'm keeping these, but this is my tip to you guys. If you want to hear wild-ass vintage rockabilly and rock and roll, Desperate Rock and Roll. Killer series. There's a, a, a Rhythm and Blues companion series called Stompin' that is also highly recommended, and a companion series to that called Black Rock and Roll. Anything from those three series... I guarantee satisfaction. What else am I selling? I'm selling a couple of things. I'm going to be selling this one, man. Here's another pop trivia quiz for you. First, let me get rid of this obtrusive uh, price tag. I want people to see this album cover in its full delight. The Gentries, with their hit single, Keep On Dancing. Who was the lead singer of the Gentries? Somebody out there knows who the lead singer of the Gentries was. Who was it? Who was the lead singer of the Gentries? In the one hit single, Keep On Dancing. And their lead singer, I'm going to give you guys a clue. Here comes the clue. Uh, James Pogo guessed already. I should have known James Pogo would be on that. Yes, he later became the mouth of the South. I'm talking about the great Jimmy Hart. Yes, Jimmy Hart started out as the singer of a rock and roll band. And this is their first album. Yeah, there you go. Marvin Haywood's got it. Alan Versapellis has it. You guys know your stuff. The Gentry's featuring the mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart, before he was a professional wrestling manager. Good stuff on this one. I, of course, already have a copy, uh, once again, on the second-rate MGM label. It's a wonder they had a hit at all on MGM, but they managed to pull it off. This is my spare copy. I'm selling it. Yes, Amy Lynn Myers, it's true. Jimmy Hart, he's one of these guys. I can't spot him, though. I don't know which one of those guys is Jimmy Hart. On some of the later albums, it's easy to spot him, but on this real uh, old one where he's really young, I honestly don't know which one he is. So maybe some of you guys out there who are sharper eyed than I am can tell us which one of these guys is Jimmy Hart. So anyway, I am parting with this one. If you want it, let me know. We'll make a deal. A deal we will make. Because I got to fund that move to North Carolina somehow. Got to pay for all that gasoline and moving trucks and storage units and all that stuff. 
Here's a query from James Pogo. Mm, James Pogo wants to know if I've ever seen a copy of Jimmy Hart's solo album. I have not. And if James Pogo has never seen it, then it's probably never been seen by anybody. Good question. James Pogo, is it like a wrestling-themed album, or does he play it uh, singer-songwriter? Tell us more about it. Post us a link. I want to know. And of course, other stuff I gathered, not at record stores, but, you know, the fun effluvia and detritus of playing a gig. Flyers, you know, flyers for our show. Flyers for other events at the venue. Big fat posters of us. Eat the turnbuckle set list with genuine blood splattered on it. Keeping that one, guys. Handwritten rehearsal lists from the anti-scene rehearsal studio. I'm not just a bass player. I'm a fan. I love this stuff. I just absolutely love these bits and pieces of rock and roll behind the scenes swag that probably most people don't give a hoot about, but I love them. So I collect all this stuff and I got boxes and stacks of it. This is my hope chest, you know, this is my scrapbook. This is how, if I ever do decide to get old and feeble, which I might decide to do someday, I don't know, but if I ever do, I'll have plenty of stuff to look at and reminisce over and get all waxy and nostalgic about. Call sheet from the anti-scene gig in York, Pennsylvania. Various set lists. Yeah, I love this stuff. Absolutely love it. And it doesn't take doesn't take a, that much room either. You can stack a thousand flyers in one box. Doesn't take much room at all. Whew. I think that's about it, guys. I think I've wrapped up the mail, the bulletin board, and the fun, fun things that one picks up on tour with a rock and roll band. So thank you guys for tuning in and listening and chiming in. I'll be reading your comments later and commenting on them myself. It's always good to know you guys are out there and want to hear my ramblings and mumblings and just things I have to say because we're all music geeks. All of us. We're music geeks. We're music nerds. We're pop culture aficionados and we all love this stuff. So I really enjoy having this roundtable discussion with you guys every week and um I do look forward to being back here in about 167 hours time to bring you the latest episode of Tent Talks Tunes. So till we meet again, and I'm saying it still, because I'm still here, I haven't become a Tar Heel yet. So this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State.